Around 400 BC, a man named Hippocrates laid the foundations of modern medicine. He believed that the human body had an innate capacity for self-healing, with the highest form of medicine to the body being everything that we put into it. Let food be thy medicine became a Hippocratic oath known around the world today. Over the course of history, our modern approach to treating illness has changed dramatically. Today, doctors receive little, if any, training in nutrition. The system has been designed around a pill for every ill and the healthcare system fights to keep it that way. It seems to be more profitable to treat ailments after they occur than to prevent them in the first place. Cardiovascular disease and cancer are the two top killers in the US annually. Additionally, 39,000 people die due to unnecessary surgery and other hospital errors. 80,000 people die due to infections and 106,000 people die due to adverse drug reactions. These statistics raise the biggest question. Why is all this happening? Why are we trapped in this system? How can we untrap ourselves? When we look at all of the data under the lens of science, the correlations that we find are jaw dropping and it's a bit of a tough pill to swallow. Nevertheless, this is something that we all need to discuss. So let's go through everything right here, right now. It seems to be a maxim of the world, something we've heard over and over again. Everybody knows it, you are what you eat. Now in the standard American regime, the average diet looks something like this. Counting strictly by percentage of calories, 63% of what we intake comes from refined and processed foods. This includes soft drinks, chips, snacks, and other things that are chemically treated and sometimes even created for us to eat. The next largest grouping is 25%, which is made up of animal food, meaning meat, dairy, fish, eggs, and other forms of seafood. The final 12% is made up of plant food. Out of that 12%, about six of it comes entirely from potatoes. And as for the other 6%, which is made up of vegetables, fruits, legumes, nuts, seeds, and grains, even half of it may be mixed with processed foods, such as the almonds in an Almond Joy. Now, we've been reading and seeing information like this for a long time, a long time. And thanks to the internet, news sources, and more and more documentaries about the topic, the information is just now starting to really reach people. Someone has to stand up and say that the answer isn't another pill. The answer is spinach. And while hundreds of thousands of people are taking notice, there still doesn't seem to be a slowdown in consumption of processed or animal foods. In fact, they appear to be increasing. But why is this? My belief based on our observations is that we really just don't know how critical this is. Because if we really knew what dangers were involved, if we really knew, we would change overnight, or at the very least, we might consider looking at things a little bit differently. The scientific evidence of correlation between the food that we eat and the diseases we have is outstanding. It's probably the most vital piece of information pertaining to not only curing all of our diseases, but the survival and future of the human race. In 1974, Chinese premier Zhou Enlai was hospitalized with bladder cancer. Knowing that his disease was terminal, he decided in his final days, he would dedicate himself to giving his country and the world a more complete understanding of cancer. He thus initiated what would become one of the largest and most thorough scientific investigations in history. 650,000 researchers cataloged the mortality patterns caused by several types of cancer between the years of 1973 and 1975. The study encompassed every county across China 880 million people. Zhou died in 1976, years before his study was complete. Published in 1981, the Cancer Atlas was the result of Zhou's initiated study. It shows a highly unusual distribution of different types of cancer in China, which tended to be clustered in certain hotspots. The results of this study demonstrated that all of the causes of these clusters of cancer had to be related to environmental factors, and in the researchers' professional opinions related heavily to diet. Two researchers who have made groundbreaking contributions to this effort are Dr. Colin Campbell and Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn. These are two of the most prominent biological nutritionists in the world today. When Dr. Campbell learned about the Cancer Atlas, it became what he described as the cornerstone of his research and took him down a road of discovery which would ultimately become published in a book called The China Study. This 20 year project examined the links between diet and disease 
in one of the few areas in the world where people still consumed a mostly plant-based diet. Dr. Campbell teamed up with Chinese and British researchers who went into 65 counties in rural China, finding out what 6,500 people ate and how they lived. They also took urine and blood samples. It took them years to analyze and correlate all of this data. In 1990, the China study was published, which identified over 94,000 correlations between diet and disease. The study was published with countless tables and charts presenting the raw data, which had been accumulated during the study. Then this information was cross-referenced in multiple ways to demonstrate its reliability and to show how it linked with the 367 different variables the study examined. The study was a very clear indication of some very powerful revelations. The moment that animal products were introduced into the diet, blood cholesterols went up, cancer started to appear, and disease started to make its way into the communities. Since this study, the connections between meat and dairy consumption and disease has now been confirmed over and over again in scientific studies and even studies of studies and peer reviewed journals. Diabetes, for example, of which roughly 30 million people in the US are reported to struggle with, has been demonstrated to be outright cured with a plant-based diet. Among the 20% of participants in the landmark diabetes prevention program who were ages 60 and over, lifestyle changes conferred a 71% reduction in risk of type two diabetes, demonstrating that older adults reaped the greatest benefit from lifestyle intervention compared to other age groups. In fact, plant-based diets, like eating patterns that emphasized legumes, whole grains, vegetables, fruits, nuts, and seeds, and discourage most or all animal products are especially potent in preventing type two diabetes and have been associated with much lower rates in obesity, hypertension, hyperlipodemia, cardiovascular mortality, and even cancer. The results were amazing. Based off the lab result I had before, I was type one. I'm not supposed to be producing insulin. This isn't supposed to happen. But as you can see from the results, I'm producing insulin. I can go from being type one to not having diabetes. That's incredible. Incredible. Diabetes is reversible. We have the results to show it. And the funny thing is, well, maybe it's not funny, but it's actually illegal in most countries to treat cancer with nutrition therapy. There have been many physicians now speaking out about this at conferences, saying that they are only allowed to treat cancer with chemo, surgery, or radiation, and they're not happy with it. What this means is that you ultimately have to take your health into your own hands. All of this research by Dr. Campbell and the researchers from China and Britain correlated heavily with Dr. Esselstyn's work, who demonstrated how to naturally reverse heart disease and outlined the specifics of what happens to the body when you eat animal and processed foods. You see, lining all of our blood vessels are something called endothelial cells. These cells are vital to survival for they naturally produce nitric oxide, which keeps our blood flowing smoothly without being sticky or clogging up. It also helps to dilate blood cells during physical activity and inhibits the formation of plaque, as well as eliminates the inflammation that comes along with plaque in the first place. Scientific tests have demonstrated that when we start eating the standard American diet, meaning predominantly animal and processed foods, our endothelial cells are damaged and can no longer support the healthy flow of blood through the body. This leads to numerous issues such as clogged arteries, diseases, cancers, feelings of heaviness and cloudiness of mind. On the surface level, it showed that a plant-based diet is beneficial for human health and an animal-based diet simply is not. Dr. Esselstyn's research, however, demonstrated that if anybody, regardless of who they are, adopt a plant-based diet, we instantly begin to reverse the process of damage caused by meat and processed foods. Let food be thy medicine. Change yourself and change the world. You are what you eat and it's time to shift our way of life. Now, as we continue our journey into physical health, let's take a look at what for most of us is already in our bodies. More specifically, how we can optimize our bodies by getting rid of that which does not support us and giving ourselves that which does. Solving a problem means acknowledging first that there is one. And as most of us are aware, there's a lot of toxins in our bodies. In order to clean our bodies and thus clear our minds, we must become aware of what is actually going on and how those toxins got there in the first place. Brace yourself. If you've never heard this stuff before, it could be pretty shocking. 
Let's start with some basic biology. Scientists have estimated that there's probably close to 37 trillion cells in our bodies. Each individual cell is a living functioning organism, all working together for you. And each cell has a basic role and function in your life. Some are there to build new tissues. Others are there to transport nutrients around your body. And some like stem cells are waiting on reserve to transform into what your body needs at any given moment. You quite literally are your own quantum ecosystem of life, which both survive by and make up the totality that is you. And yet to think that we're an island unto ourselves can be very misleading. These cells are nourished, experience growth and cell division by the process of metabolizing the nourishment that we are feeding them. This basically means that our entire bodies on a cellular level relate heavily to whatever it is that we've been feeding them. From a more spiritual perspective, you might think of it as other forms of life moving through you. This is identical to the idea that all of the atoms and particles that make up your body and all of the things in existence are constantly moving through all of us and not isolated to any one individual or thing. This has some astonishing energetic and conscious implications. If we take into our bodies other cells for nourishment that are devoid of nutrients or during the growth process had been absent of caring and loving hands, we are essentially taking in nourishment that, well, in layman's terms, is simply not very nourishing and our bodies ultimately suffer for it. If an animal has been suffering and abused its entire life, when you eat it, all of that fear, that adrenaline, that suffering now enters into your body and adds that trauma into your wider body of consciousness. You can really see that these animals are experiencing pain and terror and all these sorts of things because you can see them when they're not and you can see them when they are and it's pretty damn obvious. You now share in the experiences of more suffering, more stress and more anxiety than you ever did before because of what you're bringing into your body's ecosystem. And so now we are going to cover some of the biggest factors affecting our health by taking a look at by far the largest food group that the majority of us are consuming and the effects that can happen by consuming too much processed foods. What is a processed food? The technical definition is actually any food that has been altered from its original natural grown state, often for the purpose of preserving the food and making it last longer. In layman's terms, it is any food that has undergone some kind of process to change it chemically or physically. From this perspective, we have to approach the topic on a selective case by case basis. It's true that most foods that are available in the grocery stores are processed in some way and do contain ingredients that are not healthy for us. It's also true that if old granny on her farm grew some apricots and then put them in a jar and stored them for the winter times, that too is technically processing. With that said, we're going to look more specifically at the types of processed foods that the majority of people eat on a daily basis, which unfortunately are very far removed from anything natural. In most cases, to create these kinds of foods, almost everything nutritious has been removed. The water is removed, the fiber is removed, the minerals are removed, and then everything is done to ensure that these foods are highly concentrated with fat, salt, and sugar. These then become a low-grade addiction, or depending on the person, a very serious high-grade addiction. Let's take a look at each one of these things individually, shall we? Sugar. Probably one of the biggest addictions out there and responsible for a tremendous amount of health issues in the world, the average American consumes between 82 and 153 grams of sugar every day. However, most health associations only recommend between 25 and 36 grams per day. And some even say that that's too much, especially in its refined form, rather than consuming sugars from say, eating an apple. The result of having too much sugar in your diet has been proven to cause metabolic dysfunction, including weight gain, increased bad cholesterol, elevated blood sugar, abdominal obesity, elevated triglycerides, and even high blood pressure. It also increases your uric acid levels, causes cavities, induces insatiable hunger, causes diabetes, liver failure, pancreatic cancer, kidney disease, heart disease, cognitive decline, gout, and a wide array of other nutritional deficiencies. Forbes Business Magazine published an article showing that the biggest culprits of where all of this sugar is coming from, topping the list is regular old soft drinks, followed by candy, then cakes, cookies, pies, other pastries, then fruit drinks, followed by dairy desserts and milk, and then other grains. Sugar also affects hormones in the brain, which produces excess fat, 
which ultimately makes sugar to be one of the leading contributors of obesity in children and adults. To conclude this topic, when our bodies consume sugar, low levels of opioid and dopamine chemicals are released in much the same way as many addictive hard drugs. In fact, scientists have consistently argued over whether sugar is as addictive as cocaine or even more so, but that's a whole nother story on its own. Fat. When we're talking about fat, we must note that there are a plethora of different types. Natural fats, like that which is found in an avocado, are much better for you in moderation and are in fact necessary for your body. Other fats on the other hand, such as saturated fats, which come from butter, cheese, red meat, and other animal-based foods, top the list of the leading contributors of heart disease out there. There are also trans fats, which most often come from oils through a food processing method called partial hydrogenation. When oil is hydrogenated, it changes from a healthy form of fat to a very unhealthy form called trans fat, which boosts the blood levels of bad cholesterol or low density lipoprotein. Typically, food like donuts, baked goods, pie crusts, cookies, crackers, and stuff like that are loaded with trans fats, which increase bad LDL cholesterol and lowers good HDL cholesterol. In simple terms, the whole thing with bad fats is that they put you at risk of cardiovascular disease, which has the potential to really clog up your arteries and may even lead to an abrupt and untimely death. When it comes to fat, the most important thing you can do is to be very aware of the food labels on the packages that you buy. Does it have any percent of saturated or trans fats, especially trans fat? If so, your best bet is to find an alternative that satisfies what you're looking for. Salt. The final ingredient of the big three aspects of processed food is salt. Salt is a leading cause of hypernatremia, which is defined as a huge imbalance of the amount of salt or water in the body. The simple version is, it increases blood pressure, causes heart disease, strokes, and osteoporosis. Elevated sodium levels can negatively affect the function of the inner lining of the blood vessels, particularly those endothelial cells that we looked at in part one. This can also lead to a decreased rate of glomular filtration, which are a sign of chronic kidney disease and kidney failure. Salt even causes cognitive disorders by causing the sympathetic nervous system to overreact to stressful situations, pumping out chronically high levels of stress hormones. Which means that if you have a lot of salt in your system and something stressful happens, you're going to be way more stressed out about that thing than if you had ideal sodium levels in your body. It's like, have you ever seen those videos of people getting salty while playing video games? It's funny because on the internet, the term salt is used to describe players freaking out, throwing chairs or having tantrums and getting frustrated when they lose a big match at Super Smash Bros or whatever. And yet salt isn't just a throwaway term to describe tension. I'd reckon that if we tested these players' blood levels, we'd probably find that a majority of them are more than a bit dehydrated. The source of the salt is, much like with the other stuff, in all of the foods that we normally eat daily. Aptly named the Salty Six, meats, pizza, canned soups, breads and rolls, chicken, and burritos and tacos. Roughly 77% of salt in the average diet comes from processed foods, and it's often added so heavily to increase the storage life of the product that the companies can sell food long after they are produced. Other additives. In addition to these three major additives found in our food, there are also countless additives in the form of preservatives, anti-foaming agents, food coloring, color retention agents, emulsifiers, anti-caking agents, acidity regulators, glazing agents, flavor packs, thickeners, stabilizers, humectants, and tracer gases that are often added to our foods. This list is actually ridiculously long and too much to cover in one video. Sometimes these can be the worst things for us in that canned food or boxed whatevers that we find ourselves consuming. It's very, very important to read the labels and do some research for what specifically is in our foods before we buy them. I know sometimes it can be hard to let go of an old food source that we love so much, but just remember, it's not actually you that really wants the food. It's the bacteria in your system which has built up a craving for that specific food. As our way of eating changes, that bacteria goes away and we start to find natural foods more appealing. In fact, you'd be surprised that after some time, you will actually find that fast food that you used to love so much grows to be entirely unappealing. And now on that note, 
Over time, as you remove processed flavor enhancing agents from your regular diet, your taste buds will also begin to change. Suddenly, you will be able to notice the subtle sugars within things like carrots, and they will taste sweeter and better than they ever did before. And that is just the beginning of flavor paradise. So before we move on, I'd like to leave you with some good news. This would be that regardless of what level of disease, illness, or just general health challenges that you might have, simply changing what you're putting in your body automatically begins changing your physical ecosystem. It's not about how many pills you're taking. It's just about letting real healthy food be your medicine. Your body is your greatest investment. So treat it right and it will treat you back. If you're struggling to get started eating healthier, try this for an approach. Instead of thinking about all the things you have to remove from your diet, look instead at all of the new things that you can add. If you start tomorrow with a green smoothie, you may notice that you no longer want that extra cup of sugary coffee on your brain. Add an extra apple or a handful of unsalted nuts as a light snack and see if you're less hungry come supper time so you can eat a little less. Try it for yourself and as always have your own experience. Your body knows what's best for you, so listen to it. So now before I begin to move into the next segment, I'd like to take a moment to talk about physical health and why we've made this big movie about it. The simple version is this, we can't get to this level of like a spiritual ascension if we're all sick. See, health is currently a huge topic of concern in the world. There's really such an abundant need for it. If none of us are healthy, then we will only continue to create an unhealthy reality all around us. So with this movie, we are establishing the base from where we are able to grow to new levels of human experience. And just like the smallest plant or tree, this all starts at the root and that root includes health. So we began talking about health by looking at one of the fundamental aspects of health, which is food. And now it's time we move on to the second largest group of consumed food in the standard American diet, specifically animal food. This will likely be one of the heaviest topics that we go through throughout this movie. And so this is a little bit of a warning that while inconvenient to look at, doesn't make it any less real. Ultimately, this moves into the discussion of raising our frequency, healing our bodies and changing the world. In order to do that, we have to look at all of the information, including how the food that we eat affects our body, mind, and spirit. There is a lot of controversy in today's world around animal food. Is it healthy? Is it unhealthy? And if it wasn't hard enough to find quality information, we are also bombarded by a ridiculous amount of advertising and conflicting scientific studies. I'm going to share with you the best research that I've found, and I encourage you to continue this research to find the deeper truth within you on your own. Meat is a very large topic. Beyond the different types of meat and meat products, there's also the discussion of the studies linking meat and disease, the massive conversation concerning the agricultural industry, and of course, if it's even morally or spiritually ethical to eat meat in the first place. In this section, we are just focusing specifically on the meat itself and the research surrounding it. Historically, humans have been eating meat since before recorded history as a mechanism for survival, and we did so seemingly without any problems. So how can something that we have been doing for so long suddenly be so deadly to us? And then why is it that we still keep wanting more? So let's take a look at the types of meat out there, shall we? When talking about meats today, generally it's split into four different categories, being processed meats, red meats, white meats, and organic meats. Now processed meats are by far the most dangerous for your health, as many factors will take scraps or other undesirable parts of different kinds of animals, throw them into a blender, add a bunch of preservatives, salts, and other additives, wrap them up all fancy-like and sell it to you as food. Processed meats include your sausages like pepperoni and other common products like hot dogs. It's also worth mentioning off the bat that the World Health Organization and the International Agency for Research on Cancer, among other scientific institutions, have officially classified processed meats as a carcinogen, which means it is confirmed to cause cancer. This is based on over 800 studies as of 2015. First on the list is red meats, which are red and come from mammals, including but not limited to lamb, cows, pigs, and others. A common source of red meat are dairy cattle, which are no longer producing their milk quotas and are sent to slaughter, as well as the majority of bulls that are born. Red meats are often considered very nutrient rich, but also contain a high amount of saturated fats. The next section of meats are the white meats. These are meats that simply enough 
change to a whitish color when cooked and often even appear white while raw. These meats mainly come from birds like chicken and turkey, but also include some fish too. White meats are often considered by the general public to be more healthy for you than red meats as they usually contain less fats and are a leaner source of protein. The last category of meats are your organic meats. These are animals that have been naturally fed and raised without the use of growth drugs or hormones injected into them. The organic label, at least as far as beef goes, also sometimes comes with a grass fed sticker. This means that the cow was fed its natural food source, grass, rather than grains, which is what the majority of mass cattle farms feed their cows. So if you're going to eat beef regardless, ideally, this is the meat that you want to get. However, it's very important to make the effort to really find out what the practices are like from the companies that you're buying from. One common discussion in the case for animal-based diets is that people like the Inuit or the Maasai have been eating lots of meat as a staple in their diets for hundreds, if not thousands of years, significantly more than the average Westerner, but yet still remain in excellent health. We have found that there is a huge difference between natural meat from an animal found in nature versus meat that has been processed or grown in a factory farm. Further, the lifestyle of the Inuit and the Maasai people is a very active one with lots of physical exercise, traveling, and even building snow houses just to stay alive. In comparison to the average first world lifestyle, we do not nearly exert the same levels of physical activity as they do. And so if our body isn't going to use it, it's going to store it. This is a big part of our research on animal foods because we eat far more meat than what our bodies are physically utilizing, which is one of several problems. However, beyond that, it seems as though many new studies are now pointing to the notion that meat in general was never something that we were really supposed to eat in excess and that more than just a tiny bit can have adverse effects on the body. And now here's where things get interesting, although we did talk on this a little bit before. There are now a large number of doctors and scientific studies coming forward with research showing tremendous links between meat and some of our most serious diseases. Dr. Rashmi Sinha, PhD, is one such doctor who has correlated a lot of this data in a study she wrote with the National Cancer Institute. Among those studies, we found this. The association between consumption of red or processed meats and cancer, particularly colorectal cancer, is very consistent. The research continues. In 2007, a systematic review of scientific studies led the World Cancer Research Fund and the American Institute for Cancer Research to conclude that red or processed meats are convincing or probable sources of some cancers with specific links to lung, esophageal, stomach, pancreatic, and endometrial cancers, and of course, colorectal cancer. Due to the high amounts of saturated fats, meats have also been heavily linked to type two diabetes. And in addition to that, Processed meats also contain preservatives, such as nitrosamines, which are toxic to the pancreatic cells that produce insulin. And so diabetes risk is even higher for those who eat a lot of processed meats. But it's not just red meat. A major 2006 study of 135,000 people found that those who frequently ate grilled skinless chicken had a staggering 52% higher risk of bladder cancer than people who never ate it at all. In addition to cancer risks, white meat is also linked to clogged arteries, osteoporosis, and diabetes just by the animal protein alone. Eggs are the same story, where studies have linked eating eggs to stroke, diabetes, heart disease, and prostate cancer. The fat content in meat can also contribute to the estrogen and progesterone sensitive forms of breast cancer. Furthermore, growth hormones used on animals in the production of meat can exhibit estrogenic activity which also boosts breast cancer risk. Across the board, the World Health Organization has determined that dietary factors account for at least 30% of cancers in Western countries and 20% in developing countries. Apart from the diseases that we've mentioned, eating excess meat can also lead to an increased risk of foodborne illnesses being transmitted and may contribute to erectile dysfunction in men. There is also evidence that it may make you resistant to some antibiotics and apparently, even increases risk of death. So that's pretty heavy. What's the cause? Scientists have found that there are three basic causes of disease within meat. These include too many saturated fats, carcinogens that form when meat is cooked and something called heme iron. Let's see what each of these do. Animal-based fats can contribute to the cause of heart disease and stroke by increasing plaque lining the walls of your arteries. This makes it harder for your heart to pump blood through the narrowed blood vessels, which can possibly lead to a heart attack, 
putting on extra weight, high blood pressure, and cardiovascular disease. When meat is cooked at high temperatures, carcinogenic chemicals called heterocyclic amines are created that may increase the risk of breast